Hey, Jens, how's it going? Uh, good, Steve. What's up, okay. man? <laughs> so this is a show that I really love because this is like a, a trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just so great to talk about cameras. And everybody loves cameras. They're fun. Right. So I want to introduce a good friend now. We, we met on, on your podcast, and David is a, a man after our own heart because he goes, he goes back even farther than we do. Mm -hmm. And this is David Leitner. And how are you doing, David? I'm good. So uh, why don't you just give us a little bit about your past and uh, so people know what you're all about. Well, some people know me from when I was a technical director at Duart Labs in New York. Uh, some people know me, briefly I was a, a union DP. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, I've had uh, eight films uh, as director, producer, or DP at Sundance uh, over the years since the 80s. Uh, I've also been involved in camera design and ergonomics for a very long time. I have a background in optics uh, at uh, Duart. We did a, I, I built their optical printing department years ago. They were famous for blow-ups uh, from 16 to 35, and from super 16 to 35. Uh, in the early 80s to late 80s, I was the person who uh, was uh, instrumental in introducing super 16 at Duart, which... Uh, eventually took off, but back in those days, no one knew what the heck that was. At the same time, I was involved uh, from almost the get-go with video cameras, including the early 3.2 beta cams. I hauled those through the mountains of El Salvador during the war. Uh, you know, that was when the three tubes had come out of alignment, and God, that was a whole era that I'm happy went, that went away. Uh, I'm, I, I loved the CCDs when they came in, and I loved CMOS better. And... Um, Bringing this all up to date, I, I continue to use, I've shot with about every camera there is at some point, and I continue to kind of surf the cutting edge because I find it exciting, as you do. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, that's I'm the show. <laughs> there we go. So I'm going to make one little technical change. I want to tell the people in the control room to turn the air off because I want the sound to be just perfect on this show. Right. So, As we know, if bad sound is worse than bad picture. Yeah. You know and we're talking I mean? about cameras. So, <laughs> yeah, right. yes, okay. That's true. Uh, so Wait, um, let's not forget to introduce Rachel, our oh, digital right. marketing yeah, director. Hey, Rachel, how's it going? You got some questions in the hopper, hopefully. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm following the chat as usual. Um, so if you have anything you want to talk about, pop it in there and I'll make sure the guys get to it. Um, Steve, do you have something you want to start with? Or I've yes. got a question if you want to start with that. Nope. I want to start with, uh, I want to roll a clip because uh, Zacuto, people who've been here know that we have like a little museum of cameras. David, you have to come here sometime. You are going to love this. But it, it's kind of a, uh, a, an evil museum because we've just bolted these things to the wall, but you'll see in a second. Yeah, all right. So let's roll that clip. This is my first camera right here. Uh, KY 1900 JVC. You had to use a recorder with it, and this was a three chip Satacon camera. Bought it in 1981 at the Film Center in New York, used. Let's move over here. This is the second camera that Jens and I used. Now, these, this is a three tube Plumicon camera, and what you had to do with these cameras is you had to also use a cord and go to a recorder. FP22, here's a photo of me using this camera in the early, early 80s. Uh, I shot some crazy music video with it. KY310, this is a VHSC sort of beta cam-ish two-piece system where you would buy this front end and you would drop this deck on the back end. Like a museum here at Secuto with old cameras. Check out this one. Here's an old TV camera that they would have like in a small kind of local TV station. Here we got a Sony beta cam. Uh, this was a two-piece beta cam. I love this one, man. Look at this Hitachi. I love the EVF here. So look at here. We took the plate off the side here, and you can actually see the three tubes. And we got a sharp camera. Here's a Sony camera. Here's like one. This went to a half-inch open reel machine. Here we got a Nikagami. Really nice camera. This is a beautiful old, like, little TV camera, probably from the early 70s uh, for when they were doing uh, live video prior to having video recorders. Look at that, another TV camera from a studio. Uh, Ikigami HL79E, E, D. These were $80,000 cameras in their heyday. You can see that. <laughs> what do you think, David? How was that? But you know what's ironic is that I filmed all that with my phone. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, go on. <laughs> 
No, that's a, a blast from the past. Um, it's it's almost a little bit of a PTSD too, <laughs> because I yeah. remember all the setup that was requ required with those cameras. You know, those uh, Hitachi uh, EVFs uh, had waveform displays in them, which is something that I would some of them did, and it's something I, I for years I've been beating the drum about uh, EVFs because I thought back then the black and white EVFs were like sensory deprivation. Uh, having come from film, I was used to an optical viewfinder. And those Hitachis, I remember, for the uh, waveform display, because it was fantastic. Yeah. It was very useful. Uh, that, that, just so everybody knows, that's probably about 5 or $6 million worth of equipment in its heyday. In its heyday. Hey that's yeah, that's its crazy hey to think. Okay, so now I want to bring the conversation back so that people, uh, let's start with film. Obviously, we've all worked on film. And you made an interesting comment the other day about film. Yeah, you mean uh, that the nomenclature that we use with most of the cameras today come from film? Is that the no? Kind that of really, talking? if you you know, we're gonna we're gonna just sort of bypass film basically because since the beginning of film, oh, I see what you're saying, and the beginning of video in the '70s for the well, no, no going to the '50s, yeah. uh, film really hasn't changed. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. added a few digital features to it, but you know, Near it's still end. a shutter with 24 frames. David, yeah, that technology didn't change in like a hundred years, but all of a sudden, <laughs> right. What do you think? Yeah, that's true. Uh, I don't have much more to add to that. Okay, so um, then go on. But, but, I, shot, well, I shot so much film, I can load film cameras in my sleep. Right. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully in the dark. <laughs> <things set up. laughs> yeah. Well, he said in his sleep. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> okay, so Jens, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that uh, uh, in the 80s, near well, maybe even a little bit, yeah, probably in the early 80s, uh, what I found really interesting was the combination of video cameras for the video tap, you know, for the director to watch the monitor, that whole process that started to uh, blend itself with film. That was the early stage. And you know who yeah. that was invented by? Oh, yes, Jerry Lewis. Yeah, that, that's such a strange. Uh, <laughs> I think it was Cinderfella that he invented that, right? Yeah, the, the video assist. David? Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. So, anyway. No, 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 no. I mean, what, what I was trying to say is I shot one of the early uh, feature films on HD. Um, this would have been around 2000 or 2001 that was uh, intended for transfer to film. Now, there were there is a history of 20 years before that of people shooting feature films on various video formats. But once I shot on HD, and this was a, a film I switched from 35 millimeter to HD, uh, I haven't gone back much to film. Mm -hmm. There are advantages to digital, uh, we're no longer in the analog era, that are so exciting. Uh, and I'm speaking as a person who used to work in a film back in back of the, the color grading station that has more power than what it would, we could spend, you know, three quarters of, of a million dollars on, on a Da Vinci big iron system, you know, 30 years ago, d doesn't match this. Yeah, no, that's we're, true. We're living in an amazing time right now. We sure are. So I, I, what I want to do is I want to go, for, I want to kind of jump uh, really quickly from film to live television. So when, which is kind of funny because we've sort of circled around and we're doing live television right now. But I don't know if people realize that in the 50s, they didn't really have video recorders. So the process was that you would do what we're doing right now. And we were actually trying to do this the other day. It's unbelievable. But you, you switch live and then you broadcast. So like, you know, shows like, uh, you know, Milton Berle's show of shows, they didn't really ever in think of syndication, so they just threw it out there live and then it was gone. Mm, Desi Lu did though. He was one, well yeah, that's a whole nother topic, <laughs> but there was a process called kinescope, and I'm gonna let David get into this, which was essentially what I'm gonna call the first video recorder, mm -hmm. which is where you actually, well David, go ahead and you tell him, because this is up your you alley. Know, actually, if you watch the old Jackie Gleason shows, it always says at the end that they were shot on electronic cam. And electronic Cam was was the uh, partially oh. silvered mirror to the video camera at that time, so that it was recording a film copy at the same time it was recording an electronic copy. Um, kinescopes, you're right, uh, were how we preserved. We ran kinescopes at Duart. Uh, 
Boy, that's such a long time ago. <laughs> if, if it weren't for kinescopes, we wouldn't have a lot of that material from back then. Uh, video recording, uh, Ampex, what, introduced the first uh, VTR in 1957, I think. Show it was that Ray Dolby. picture. I, Show yeah. us the picture right here. Let's take a peek at it. Because uh, I think that people need to see. This is the v BAM. Go mm -hmm. full screen on this. That is the first video recorder. So imagine putting that on your back or going out <laughs> on location. So this kinescope process was basically you just filmed a television monitor. That's all you did. So mm -hmm. like often you can see the corners of the, of the TV monitor on kinescope things like for instance, you know, uh, we one time saw a kinescope version of Jackie Kennedy giving a tour mm -hmm. of the White House right. on that fancy TV on Especially the other side. Especially these days when you're kind of overscanning. Back then, remember, the monitors were always, you know, cropping in. And so some you of them probably were... never saw that. Right. Now, roll picture two here. Well, kinescope, kinescopes had special CRTs. Kinescopes had very high resolution CRTs, even though it was a 480 line structure image. And the... Uh, uh, geometric correction was was very high. Hmm. Uh, the the shutters and the cameras were set to a specific angle. They were about as good as you could get back then. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were special devices. You weren't just shooting off of a TV screen. Yeah. Let's roll the second picture. Okay. Go full screen on this. I know it looks like he has a jet pack on. <laughs> it does. But uh, the idea of being able to n n record video is a major thing that people don't realize. I mean. That thing on his back is a video recorder, and the camera's obviously in the front. Now, the beauty of this is, is you know, he could go out in the field. That, that, I think that's a one-inch backpack recorder, but he could come back to the studio, and they would immediately have videotape uh, because, okay, come back to us now. Uh, the, the, prior to that, uh, they used to have this stuff called video news film. And, you know, you would go out, even in the Reagan era, mm -hmm. you would go out in the 80s and you would shoot this video news film. And I think there's actually a picture of you do, having one of these video news film cameras in your, uh, in your pictures, David. And they would process the film and it would immediately uh, be telecine. So this is yeah. totally in his department. Right. Uh, talk, David. Tell us well, about actually, this. Actually, that, that VNF wasn't put on a telecine. It was put on what was called a film chain. They were usually built by Ooh. RCA, and they were, they were projectors pointed into a video camera. They use an intermittent movement. They pull down the film one frame at a time. Uh, Telecities run continuously, and they didn't arrive till the very late 70s. Uh, Duart in New York had the first uh, ranks and tell telecine, and that brought everything up to a new level because the film chains, all the jitter that a, a film projector has, those film chains had that jitter. Uh, oftentimes on television, stuff that came off of a film chain, it had uh, tape splices in it, and often it had grease pencil marks. And if you're old enough, you remember seeing commercials on TV with grease pencil marks on them and dirt. Do you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Vaguely, but yes. Uh, <laughs> totally. Now, you know, I don't know if you know that I used to hang out in your neck of the woods there in the film center. Remember the film center? It was like oh, yeah. about Absolutely. four buildings 66. down from, from Duart. Sure. That's, sure. That's where I bought that camera mm -hmm. that I showed. Okay. So let's get back on topic here. So, uh, so we talked about how, uh, you know, this, this idea of being able to record video. And uh, so now that led us to kind of you know, when, the, when you could have a two-piece system. Uh, and uh, that camera that I showed, I had a KY-1900, and then I had a portable sort of uh, three-quarter inch. They did have portable kind of half-inch recorders, I think, at, before that. But really, three-quarter inch was a major leap. Uh, and then we were using that in, in the online room because it was a cassette format. And then we would, like, do online to one-inch open reels. So you obviously yeah, remember well, that. Yeah, three quarter inch was actually the original uh, half inch. It was it was VHS that was larger, and it was introduced as a consumer format, and it didn't catch on because it was too big physically. The cassettes were too big. Uh, people in Los Angeles in the film industry buying them and using them to privately show things, and Sony uh, realized and Panasonic, the people behind the VHS consortium, realized they had to shrink it down. Uh, Sony, of course, went with Betamax. So Betamax was their shrunk version of three-quarter U-Matic. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, uh, in the 70s, we were using Portapacks. 
as you say, we would have a video camera with a cable and it would go into a half inch recorder. That was a port of pack. They were black and white. And there's a lot of port of pack stuff from that era that's pretty amazing. Well, we used we came in with the BVU 110. Remember that? That yeah. was like the portable three quarter inch. As a matter of fact, my mm -hmm. grandfather was like a guy that bought every single thing new. And I, I remember telling you, we had a thing that was a, a magna box. And it, we had, I remember that we recorded roots on videotape. Yep. So those were, they were about eight and a half by 11 videotapes. And you would stick them in this recorder, you would shove it down, you would push the play and record button, pause, and then it had a clock that had a 20 yeah. that looked like one that you would uh, like that you would use to turn your sprinkler on you're bringing back memories <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember this magna box thing oh, yeah 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 you're describing it perfectly yeah and and i'm not kidding we recorded roots so you remember when that was on <laughs> and, All right. and we had like it was a one hour tape but uh you brought up an interesting memory about this whole betamax uh thing uh, a lot of people don't know this, but that to me is probably the most singular financial disastrous move in the history of mm. anything. Because can you even imagine how many license fees that JVC got for their VHS format mm. when, when Betamax was first out? And I believe the problem was is that Sony wasn't willing to license Right. that format to other companies to make cassettes. Now, I could be wrong, and David's going to correct me here. But, right. No, in, in a funny way, it's slightly different. Sony wouldn't permit pornography to be recorded on that format. I, I'm being blunt. Hmm. And um, Panasonic and the rest of the com companies in the VHS consortium didn't have a problem with that. God, have pornography you... is, what, is what caused Half Inch to explode. But I mean, first off, having you here is incredible because it's like I'm learning so much, it's amazing. But seriously, how much money, if you envision how, how Betamax went away, did Sony lose in that game? But look at it a different way. Sony got their revenge because the cassette, the Betamax cassette, is the same as the Beta Cam cassette. And Sony took over the professional recording world with Beta Cam. Panasonic tried to create a VHS version called Recam. Yeah. It never caught on. They got slaughtered. I remember Recam. But the thing is, is that, uh, well, this is another thing that we can get into about how generationally Sony sort of owned the late 70s, 80s, into the 90s, and then kind of Panasonic took over for a while, you know, with yeah. all their different formats. Do you, remember the, do you remember the first... Uh, from camcorder it wasn't the beta cam it was the hawkeye from rca they built it i, I saw it in hmm. a simply uh equipment show in maybe 1981 did and sony basically took that idea and did what sony does best and uh came out with that gigantic two-piece thing that you showed mm -hmm. uh, boy i remember those yeah with sata contents by the way yeah, okay. So now uh, hey, you brought us to an interesting moment. I'm just going to jump in here yep. with a question, if that's okay, Steve. Yes, of course. Uh, we've got a comment here from Jose Mujica who says, question, there are still a few filmmakers like Spielberg who still shoot film and do not want to switch to digital. I've never shot film, but looking at BTS footage for the post, I noticed all their film cameras had an awful lot of digital gear for wireless video, focusing, replaying footage, etc., Is filming on film today anything like it used to be? It seems film to them is just a different storage media, but they're still taking advantage of the digital age. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is a really powerful question. It, 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 it comes down to aesthetics, I think. You know, it, it's got a different yeah. look and a feel to it. You know, it doesn't matter how the camera's dressed up with other electronic accessories. It's still film and it's a certain aesthetic, you know. There is an issue in that, oh, this is going to be painful to hear, but when you work on film, you're really a photographer. You have to be able to, you know, when we looked at scenes, we dealt in ratios. So like when I would say, look, I want a three to one ratio, a four to one ratio. That's not talked about anymore because we can just look at the monitor. David's just smiling here. Mm -hmm. I love this. Well, you had to picture <laughs> it. Uh, you had to picture it in your mind, you know, you know and ahead you, of time. You, you, you yeah. had to sort of know the stock and predict what was going to happen by what you were seeing. You couldn't just look at a monitor and, 
and say, oh, this is what I'm getting, great. Yeah, a DP was, was much more of a, uh, well, and the operator and the assistant, it was a multiple of people you needed. It was, it's nothing like working on video. I mean, the camera assistant was like the scariest job on the entire set because the dude could fog your film or the loader. Yeah. I mean, I love this. Just smiles, he has, smiles, smiles. He's that like, assistant had the most responsibility in a way. He's just like, holy, oh God, we used to be like, we will never do that job, man. Don't want to upset them. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so it was, it was a science that you had to learn over time. You couldn't just pick up a camera and say, let's go. Uh, David? There was a, an apprenticeship, in effect. You usually came in as an assistant camera person, and you worked with somebody who was a master, in effect. Whether they were shooting features or, or, or uh, doing commercials or doing industrials, you worked with somebody who taught you the, rope, the ropes. And that's completely gone away. All you need now is a, is a credit card from your dad, and you can go to B&H and buy a camera, and you're a DP. Mm. Uh, and, and that's fantastic because that's opened up uh, the entire world of, 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 of motion picture imaging to everybody, but the downside is you don't get the benefit of working under somebody who's extremely experienced and is, is willing to teach it to you. Oh, that's such an incredible statement right. because it, it's what we used to call the craft system, where you would work your way up. You would start as a best boy, you would maybe become a gaffer's assistant or a grip, and you would work mm -hmm. your way up the system, or you were in the camera department and hope, you know, you, you didn't generally, you were either in the grip electric department, the camera department. No, but e even though the cameras are fantastic these days, like you saw with my iPhone, I mean, we didn't take any care there anyway. We were just running through the halls and it looked really, you know, decent. But to do it properly, you still need those disciplines that you would, uh, you know, would have yeah. learned back in the day, um, you know, and still need to be cognizant of lighting because lighting is lighting. You know well, I mean? it's <laughs> the art of filmmaking. But, but Jens, Jens, you're, you're a real camera person you're a real dp and a filmmaker and just watching how you shot that even though you had an iphone in your hand you knew what you were doing the pacing well, the framing was was great you gotta the, keep it moving <laughs> the other the other issue that i see now is 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 that we light to practicals where we used mm -hmm. to light we used to light and then we would supplement with the practicals. And that's the big difference, I think, with digital versus film. That can go wrong, though, if you don't know what you're doing with that. You know right. And, you know, we so. had to know color temperatures. Uh, you had to know depth of field. So, like, we would go to our assistant. And, and this is something that people probably don't know. But the assistant's manual, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we got to get this shot where David's on the screen because I, I just love <laughs> the look on his face here. Um, a real assistant was such an, a, a, a technical, incredible job that I remember we were shooting one time and we would look to the assistant and we would say, are we good? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words- You mean the depth of field yes, range that we had? Exactly, yes, like, right. like is, is, is his eyes and his eyes behind him three feet gonna be in focus? And mm -hmm. he would look at it and he would, he would know between the aperture and the, and the, and the, and the uh, ASA and everything, he'd be like, you're good. Yeah. And then we would trust in that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that is a huge responsibility when you're talking about major right. money on a fee. David, you know exactly what we're talking about here, right? Absolutely. And the really great assistants, they worked constantly. And they weren't people that were aspiring to be something else. They, they weren't uh, like a first or second assistant that was aspiring to be a DP necessarily. Mm -hmm. The really professional ones, that's what they did and they were really good at it. And they were always in demand. And it was a good life. Uh, the, yeah. the, the one job I never did that I would never have wanted to do was focus pulling. Oh. Those guys are all alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not while they're You shooting. can't imagine the high wire act that that is. Yeah. We didn't actually answer Jose's question, though. Uh, so so the, the, the thing is, is that, yes, these digital, he talked about, you know, fizz units and, and things like this. And we did have those, you know, I think starting from maybe the 70s on, you know, Preston made, you know, follow, fo uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 
motors and and uh, I mean you can't beat their zoom control unit to this day. I mean a lot of those accessories are electronic now, but they had mechanical versions before the tape measure instead of the you know. Yeah, <laughs> I mean oh that was the other thing. Yeah, nobody's taping you know, stuff out now. Grabbing the the, the follow focus wheel versus doing it uh, you know via wireless you know so all those accessories were still part of the film camera. His, I, I think we did answer his question. Film is a different aesthetic, so it, you know it has a different look to it than, than video. Although they're getting very close these days, hard to tell to the layman. Of well, course, well, because you can add grain. The grain structure was something that we would yeah. discuss. Yeah. You and I shot a lot of film together, and we would be like, "Do we want this grainy? Do we want it not grainy? Uh, you know, how much?" Oh, yeah. so there's a couple of other issues. One is like we're sitting here all like it's uh, la di da. We turn the air off, and it's the temperature is perfect. You know, it, back in the old days, you had to have an enormous amount of light power, and that created heat, which is added a whole, you know, and you need an electrician on set. Mm -hmm. Nobody even uses an electrician anymore. You needed an engineer on set when you started with video. Mm -hmm. These are positions that are no longer <clears throat> needed. David? I'm not sure I would go that far, but I, I haven't done a tie-in in probably 15 years, so to some degree you're right. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, film is actually still being shot quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Kodak has uh, just recently opened a lab in New York, and they've also opened a lab in Atlanta. Uh, they're only processing negative. The negative gets processed and then transferred immediately into a digital format. The thing about doing that is that once it's transferred into the digital realm, it's essentially digital. And as you, uh, as you uh, mentioned, you can strip the grain out and you can regrain it so at some point, you go into the theater and you look at something recently that was shot on film, and you can't necessarily tell it was shot on film as opposed to being shot on digital. The, the, the differences aren't that distinct anymore. Right. That's not what Kodak will tell you, and that's not what others will tell you, but that's what I've observed. But there are, there, there are other factors that, that you know, people might not think are huge, but when you're shooting on film as a director uh, and an actor, when you roll, you there's something moving through. It's not like you can just press the, the record button and just roll forever. Y your takes, I think, are going to be a little bit more um, disciplined. Meaningful. Yeah, disciplined is a better word for right. it. When you know that you want to you want to get it in three takes. You know, we're rolling each time. Absolutely. There's there's a d different kind of pressure there that makes you have that discipline that I think uh, can come through in the performances. Well, there was another That's why Clint, issue. Clint yeah. Eastwood shoots maybe two takes max on everything. Mm -hmm. And there, Clint yeah. came from that era, and he moves fast, and that's why he does that. It, when you hear film running through the camera, that's like a taxi meter going. Yeah, it's dollars exactly. and cents. Well, when we would shoot, we used to have a thing called, I mean, everybody did. We used to have a thing called a shooting ratio. So when you did your, your budget, you know, and these budgets were incredibly complex because we would do a it's called the by process transfer and, and David you know what mm -hmm. I'm talking about here so we would say if we're shooting a uh, a four to one shooting ratio and it's a 90 minute project that's 360 minutes of film at 80 I used to figure around $80 for 35 $45 for a 16 you were looking at hundred and thirty five thousand dollars on 35 and, you know, so these these shooting ratios were kind of critical. You know, you didn't sit there and go, wow, I only have, you know, six takes, but you kind of sat there and said, I only have six takes. Now, there was an incredible bonus to this. And the one thing that I hate today is that people go out and they just turn that camera on and they're just rolling and rolling mm -hmm. and rolling and rolling. And what they've done is they've now made my my editorial expense so much more money right. because he has to go through now and make a billion different go through 150 different takes and yeah. all this garbage and we've basically taken money and and I you know I don't like doing this you know I'm a mm -hmm. very few take type person because I don't want to make this editorial job you know massive right yeah I yeah I agree Right. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to shift back to the conversation. Cameras? Uh, no, 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 no. I want to play <laughs> clip two, ah. which uh, is about the video formats. Let's take a look at this, David. This is going to be a blast from the past. Okay, so what we're seeing here, we, we, we think that motion blur is a drag, but take a look at these streaks. This used to be an issue, and then this is when we went to SATACON tubes, <laughs> and uh, 
You know how hard people try to get that effect now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Remember, the, this is Nuvacon. This is actually earlier, uh, but I worked with a Nuvacon camera. Uh, wow. Uh, so... Interesting the, to see cool, the green huh? channel is the strongest. This yeah, well, the green channel is always the, no, I know. the, the it's problem. The some of these things stay the same. Uh, now, here's when we went to the CCD sensors. Remember those vertical lines you would get? Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we complain about a little bit of motion blur, <laughs> you know, the yeah. thing is, is that you're always going to have a problem. When we worked on film, Remember the issue of when we did fast pans? You had that sort of the stuttering. That yeah, what did I used to call that? That sawtooth effect. Yeah. Remember? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's still an issue for people today, especially when in Europe they have this 50 hertz thing. It's a little more pronounced. Yeah, I know? mean, you know, you work with the issues that you have, and you do the best you can, David. That's absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. So yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. Let's move a little bit. What do you have here? Can, can I bring it back a little bit? Because really, I mean, we're, we're getting a little off topic, but this is all great stuff. It's almost a show in itself. But if we're, if we're talking about how these cameras, how film cameras and then video cameras kind of ended up merging, um, it kind of started in the days where, uh, like what we did a lot, is we shot a lot of video as well. Uh, back in the 80s, but we shot it film style, okay? And I think that had a lot of influence on how video cameras of the 90s uh, uh, and 2000s sort of progressed and became the, cam the cinema cameras that they are today, you know what I mean? Um, shooting, when I say shooting film style, I'm saying like shooting one camera and you shoot it, you know, you, you do your takes, and it's not like a, in a TV studio where you have, you know, four cameras lined up with uh, operators all shooting at one time. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, pulling focus, having an assistant, even on video cameras, things like that were very film style and are directly related to even the products we make today for these so-called video cameras. You can't really call them that anymore. What, what, what do we call them these days? They're well, not video cameras. They're, they're digital cameras, they're digital I guess cameras. we yes, call yes, them. Yes, yes, yes. But the, yeah, I know because I still have this problem with roll tape. It, literally, right. David, <laughs> I cannot get that out of my head. What am I supposed to say? We used Rolling. to say well, roll film, when Omar, roll tape. Omar Rosa, when Omarosa just was <laughs> show, you know, all of that business recently in the news yeah. and everyone was talking about tapes. Michael uh, uh, Michael Cohen, he, he recorded tapes. And in fact, they were all recording that stuff with their iPhone, yeah. as you know, not even onto a removable chip. It doesn't mean tape anymore. It just means recorded it's like onto saying, something. I'm, I'm going to dial a number on the telephone. It's the same thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, no, people say I'm, I'm working on a short film. It's not a film, really, but we'll, right. we'll you know, it's, it, but we used to call them pictures, I, too, you know. Mm -hmm. so. We still say I'm filming. I still say that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, remember when we used to say, oh, that was a good picture? Right. Because it came from photography. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's well, where we... That's why it's called director of photography. Exactly. Yeah. It's not called director of cinematography. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of move through history a little bit. I want to kind of roll through some of David's pictures now. And we're going to kind of move sort of from film to where we are now. So, uh, okay, wow, nice picture. Yeah, what do you got there, David? This is probably from around 1980 or 81. It's or in that time period. It's uh, two Atom LTR sevens, and they're slightly they're mounted together, slightly angled uh, away from each other. There's two Zeiss Distic and Super Speed lenses that are one serial number apart on each of those cameras. And what I'm doing is I'm testing and comparing two different film stocks, and I'm sh but then I after I did that. I took the two images and I printed them on a panel printer in, a, in the laboratory onto a single strip of print film so that on the left, left side of the image you saw, let's say if it was a model, a female model, on the left side you saw the female model recorded from one negative and on the right side in split screen you saw the female model recorded on the second negative. And I was, by doing this, uh, they were both shot simultaneously under exactly the same conditions. It was quite a remarkable way to demonstrate differences in film stock. I'm kind of more interested in your Casio watch there. I just saw Go that. back to the picture. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Go full. Good, good eye. Good eye. <laughs> that, uh, that was, just a, when those kids, I had that was one. the hippest thing to yeah. have back then. Do people know that those little buttons were a calculator? Yeah, I had, I had one of those <laughs> okay. back in the day. Let's go to the next picture. Before we jump to the next one, David, on that picture there, we've got a question from Victor Bart who says, what kind of lens mount is that on the double camera setup? 
lens mount. Aton had its own Aton mount. It was a bayonet style mount. It was like a miniature PL mount. You can see it on both of the cameras. Now, the interesting thing is some people uh, look at the Aton as like the gold standard. There were these camps, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I, you and I, we were Airy SR2 people. We loved that camera. It yeah. was something amazing about it. It is the best camera on your shoulder ever made, balanced. It wasn't like... These guys might beg to differ. Well, but. I, I hear you, but it was Zacuto free, man. If they make that camera, we're out of business. Right. Yeah, no, <laughs> but then, then some people like this sort of Aton model, and then some people like the Eclair model. So mm -hmm. there were these... What, what, Dave, let's bring David well, back. Well, Eclair, Eclair preceded Aton. They were both French cameras. And the, the chief designer from Eclair formed his own company, Jean-Pierre Boviola, and he created the Aton camera. So the Aton's like a descendant of the Eclair. And they have similar um, um, just gestalts, if you will. It's kind of hard to explain. The, the SR was uh, designed to fit into a briefcase so that you could carry it onto an airplane. That's why it's flat the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, the Aton was designed with ergonomics in mind. And I'm from the Aton camp. Uh, I think that's the most comfortable, best fitting camera on your shoulder ever designed. And Aton used to use a, the image of a cat, a black cat sitting on your shoulder to demonstrate what their uh, er ergonomic design principle was. Hmm. And that was a famous image. Yeah, a so, lot of people. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't fit the Aton into a, into a briefcase, but you could take it apart in the field because it was designed to be disassembled under battlefield conditions. I'm not kidding. And the original LTR had a little screwdriver in it. You could pull the whole thing apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that that beautiful wood grip that has that little thing that goes through your, your thumb here, that was the Aton grip. You're starting to see a lot of very, people. Very famous. Yeah. Very famous. Still Everyone's used. copied it. Yeah, everybody has Including copied us. it. Including <laughs> us. Well, no, like... And, and you, but you know something cool? The Aton, every single square inch of the Aton was innovative in some way. And they didn't use double 15 millimeter rods. They used... The original camera had a single rod that wasn't round. It was square. And what that meant was when you... And, and it fit into a hole in the front of the camera. When you put the rod in, the rod couldn't twist because mm -hmm. it fit in square. Well, right. that, that, as opposed to yeah. you know attaching a hand grip to a rod today, and the you have to tighten it down to make sure that it doesn't rotate. Well, that square rod actually came from photography when we would have bellows. You remember on the front of a camera. Um, okay, so let's move on to your next picture. That's a, an Aton A minimum. Uh, Jean Pierre decided that he was going to design the smallest possible 16 millimeter camera. And this is what he came up with. It also was extremely innovative. On the left, just above the lens, there's a little little box, and that was a video tap, as Jens was talking about. Mm -hmm. And notice that my eye is uh, like six inches from the viewfinder. The viewfinder was meant so that you didn't have to have your eye on top of it. You could hold it away from you. And notice that I'm holding the camera not against my body, but out in front of me, like, like a, a mini DV cam camcorder and this this camera came out in around I don't know 2000 2001 around the time of the mini DV camcorders and it it, it shared the same kind of aesthetic if you will yeah we should, the ergonomics were, were pretty similar we <clears throat> should kind of mention that Abel in New York was this was really their baby this whole Aton business uh, obviously you that's where you would get them right repair them too that's what that one yep, was from absolutely yeah um, okay, no, so Pete Abel used. Go on. Yeah, Pete Abel used to work for Les Zellman, and Les Zellman was the original importer of the Aton camera. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, next image. That's from the Atacama Desert uh, in uh, Chile. This is probably around 1983 or 84. I put this picture in just because it was typical of the way we all looked back then. You know, we we're wearing the vest with a thousand pockets. It's a pretty dorky look. And uh, I'm shooting with an Aton here. There's another picture. I don't know if you included it, but I'm crouched down and holding an SR. So I used both cameras. Okay. Both There's cameras the had their. Picture. This is it. That's an SR, and this is in Monte Carlo uh, during the, the the Grand Prix race there. And I, I'm filming at some fancy, I don't know, <laughs> casino, whatever. Okay. Let's next picture. Yeah. What oh, the the, hell these is that? are. Uh, 
these are friends of mine and, and heroes of mine. That's uh, Al and David Mazels, and that's Al Mazels on the right. And the reason I included this picture was because he kind of cobbled together his own 16 millimeter camera. It's got bits of an Aracon and bits of other stuff in it. Uh, he's got a light meter glued to the side of it somewhere. Mm. He's got a mirror so that he can see when he's operating the camera, he can see the uh, focus marks on the lens. But uh, this is, I don't know, this is circa 19, maybe 60. Mm. And that's what he had to do back then. You know what that reminds you know, me of? What's that? Uh, not to interrupt, sorry, David, but it reminds me of that horrible little era we were in for a while, although it was good for us, yeah. with the depth of field adapters. Remember just before the large oh. sensor uh, quality uh, cameras were out, yeah. uh, when we were still using the, uh, the the tiny chip cameras like the uh, what HVX200. The HVX200, and you put these depth of field adapters to give it that more cinematic look. And it was like field. three feet long. Or the lack problem thereof. was, you know, you'd, you'd, when you turned this inertia, you couldn't stop and you were banging in the doorways. It and was whatnot. long like that camera and kind of cobbled yeah, together it, it in a way. To, it was to adapt a PL mount lens, right? Uh, to adapt a city lens onto those cameras. Well, really yep. what we were doing was creating depth a telecine device. There was oh, yes, a, kind of. I, I, yeah. If you think about it. it projected there, on a little screen. Yeah, and and, and we screen. videotaped it off the screen. Yep. The to, screen, right just to create that lack of depth of field. Right, yeah. uh, and I, I don't know who invented that. It could have and, been. And some, some, of them, some of them had a, some of them had an iris, a secondary iris. Remember, mm -hmm. you, had to, you had the iris on the lens and then they might have an iris on the device itself. Right, I think it was uh, Brian at, at, at uh, Red Rock Micro that possibly could have invented that thing. It, it was the, the uh, Jehu Garcia, we saw one of his versions at an NAB. Lettuce had one. Oh, let, wait, he came later though. Yeah, uh, I definitely but he's think the one Red that Rock. we packaged with our whole system. Yeah, together. yeah. Um, Boy, so this is ancient history. <laughs> it is, but you brought up a concept <laughs> that thought about this stuff in a long time. Right. There, there are two devices that you brought up a concept. Uh, well, one, but I want to bring up the, the other one. One is uh, you remember the little eyeglass that we used to look through, and it would you allow mean the contrast you to, viewing glass. Yeah, that yeah. would allow you to uh, perceive the contrast, or that you that nowadays again irrelevant. But you talked about a light meter. I don't know that those are used much anymore, but just in case nobody knows what a light meter is, is you used to be able to walk, it. there were two types, there was a spot, and then there was a, what do we call the other one? I forgot now. Well, well it's domed, so yeah, you're, the domed you're getting one. the you know, Then we had the kind you look area. through. Yeah, that's but, a spot meter. Yeah, uh, the point was well, is- One is for reflected light, and one's oh, right. for incidental light. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The reflected light is you, you, aim, you aim the spot meter at the subject or the scene, an incident light is you walk into the scene and aim the light meter at the light source. Mm -hmm. You remember those little and they're slides? Still, they're still used. They're still used. They're used by professionals, especially yeah. in Hollywood. For instance, if you want to pre-light a set, you can pre-light the set to certain levels before the camera crew arrives, before the actors arrive, whatever. You, you pre-light. And so those light meters are very useful for that. Well, now you just look at a monitor and you kind of adjust your iris. Not, not if you're pre-lighting. If your gaffer's out there pre-lighting, yeah. he, he needs to yeah. use his light meter. And, and, and when you're on a major feature, there are people that are, are using that. But do you remember the one that it was called a Spectra? Remember? Oh, sure. Spe Spectra Pro. I have one. I, I, I owned one and sold it to your cousin. <laughs> yeah, it's based. That's <laughs> I right. I kept it. Yeah, right. That's, that was sort of the standard of the industry and it had these funky remember, slides in, you put in. Mm -hmm. Right. But you remember when we got to 800 uh, EI exposure index films, there wasn't a slide for that, so you had to have a special one modified yep. because they, they, they weren't designed for films that were that fast. Right. God, how do you remember all this? It's like, I kind of remember it. Because I lived through it. I have all the scars to show for it. <laughs> well, we did too partially, hey guys, but I still can't remember. let me jump in with a question here on those uh, camera pictures. Uh, Gail Burr asks, did anyone back then do anything on quality, simple equipment over the counter as can be done today? And I suppose a better question is, was there even an equivalent to simple over the counter equipment? Like Super 8 or 8 millimeter cameras? Yeah. Sure. Super 8 Sound in Boston. Yeah, there was a whole movement towards that. Mm -hmm. Ricky Leacock at MIT, uh, if you know who that is, a very famous uh, filmmaker. There was a whole movement towards using 8 millimeter, uh, actually Super 8, with sound on it. Mm -hmm. It had sound, so it was like using a camcorder. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and it's still being used today. People still love that format. Oh, God, it's, it's funky, and that's what they love about it. It's yeah. that whole Zapruder film look, you know? What yeah. I mean? Well, oh, no, that was eight millimeter, but <laughs> I, I the, know, it's but having I mean, it, a comeback. It's that aesthetic. Kind He's of. absolutely right. There's there uh, Kodak. Remember, we saw Kodak is making a camera that records oh, yeah. video and film. 
Right. Uh, but uh, do you remember that film? Okay, so like we had. What's old is new again, man. We had 16 millimeter cameras when I was like, my grandfather had a 16 millimeter camera. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is good. I, should, I wish I had this film to, to show, David, but my grandfather shot color 16 millimeter film in 1939, like when The Wizard of Oz came out. That's rare. Uh, I which, which, have, would have been, which would have been Kodachrome. That was the only 16 yeah, color film at the time. Which is, what people need to know, that's, that's, re, that's positive. So it's a, like a slide film. Right. Uh, so the, there, that means that you, it, it has It has dyes in it that don't fade, as opposed to an ectochrome film. So if you've seen faded film, that is not Kodachrome. Mm-hmm. Kodachrome was like Technicolor. It doesn't fade. Yeah. It's remarkable. Um, Beautiful. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next. But image. your exposures had to be spot on. You didn't. Oh have, yeah. You, if if you mess that up, it was that's it. You're done. You're so right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely right. Best, well, it was the best training in, in terms of how to expose properly. Yep. That's a good point. Like when we Jens and I used to do a lot of four by five photography for ads. I would do people, and he would do products, and you were amazing at this. You just, I wish I had a photo to see how many little, hundreds of little teeny flags you would have, I mean, uh, bounce boards, and fingers, if people know what fingers are anymore, little teeny black flags, and you would shoot these products, and we would do them on 4x5, and in, in those days, you had to do it on uh, chrome film, because they did a sort of a thing called a drum scan, and there was mm-hmm. zero so they would like do all of the text and everything, and then would just drop the, the image into the uh, brochure or annual report or whatever you were making. And there was absolutely zero well, ability to alter you, you that You go film. through a lot of Polaroids to, <laughs> first. We did. To get that exposure, you, and you bracketed, you know. You only really shot one under, one over, or half under, half over, You know, maybe yeah, four well, films. R- r- once you get into it and you learn it and you know your lighting and, and it becomes second nature, yeah, you can do it pretty close, but, you know. Yeah, but they were beautiful, man. When you, when you projected, my God, when you would look at a slide, remember when your parents would bring out a projector and you'd look mm-hmm. at the slides from your vacation? There was something incredibly powerful about yeah, that. There was a depth to it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Let's take a look at you. Before next you image. guys yep. uh, move too far away from that Super 8 conversation about the old becoming new again, and Jens, I know you shot that early clip on a, on your iPhone. We've got a question here about um, predictions for the future. And mm-hmm. camera wise, Soderbergh shot his last movie with an iPhone and said he would keep using it. Do you foresee a day when phone cameras become as powerful as cinema cameras? And technology wise, what about VR? Is it ever going to take off? Those are two very big questions. They are yeah. big what do you questions. Guys think? I mean, uh, obviously, size is not an issue. You can get cameras m- minuscule now, but it has more to do with the lensing. I mean, to get certain lensing, that's going to require a certain size until this liquid lens technology is developed, yeah. which I don't know where that stands at the moment, but but lenses are gonna determine the size of your camera and, and, and what you do with it, you know, how, how, you're, how you're manipulating your image with the lenses. So that, that's the driving force of the size and how you work. We used to have a, a concept that we would pick the right gear for the right job. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, the it, I don't wanna call it a problem, but it's like people buy a camera and they use it on every job. And I have a standard line that I use. You probably are going to remember this, but I don't want to jump out of a Humvee with a red camera in a war situation. Okay, that's the wrong camera for the wrong job. And when we would evaluate a project, because when we would do all these fashion videos, we had to work on film because the video cameras would have all this mooring and the fashion industry didn't like it. And when we would do these videos, remember when we would go to Jim Beam and we would do all these bourbon videos, mm-hmm. uh, color was an issue because we wanted the bourbon to be well, right. Well, the quality so, was nowhere near film, so it was not a question. Right? Yeah, and we used to all hang out, everybody in Chicago, we hung out in two places. One was this Victor Duncan, which I'm going to get a smile here when I say Victor Duncan, right? And, oh, sure, of course. <laughs> and knew them well. That was a rental place, and all of us used to go there, and we knew Joe Settlemeyer and all these people there. Uh, And we'd all be talking about the projects we're doing and we would pick cameras there depending on the type of product You know, do we need a a camera Mm -hmm. that's super high speed? Do we need? uh, You know a a video camera that that is good in low light Um, You know, are we getting a Nikagami HL 79e, you know, uh, we, we figured all that out and it was important because That's what you did you it the the job determined the type of camera you were going to use not only See, that, what aesthetics. you're saying is, I, I, I want to underscore what you're saying. You're saying something entirely profound if 
people take one thing away from our conversation today, the right tool for the right job. You are so right about that. Almost every other big project I do, I choose a different camera because it, they have different strengths and weaknesses. And, they, uh, and, and I want to say something else. Going back to that question about using off-the-shelf equipment or consumer equipment to shoot something, people at one time, ex artists, were, were shooting uh, films in something called pixel vision, which had absolutely no resolution and certainly no color. This was, I don't know, 30 years ago. And here's the point. You can use any imaging format or camera or toy camera that you want to, but you better make sure that audio is good, like Yen said. You can bet, if you were on the set where Soderbergh were shooting his last film, you can bet that they had a full sound package with people with booms and the highest end audio recording technology. That's If you're shooting in eight millimeter or Super 8 or whatever, don't rely upon the, the low end audio record double system, Jens was right. It doesn't really matter. Your image can be pointillistic. You can have grain as big as golf balls, as long as the sound is clear. And That's the story. Important. And the important. content has to be good, too. I well, know. I'm going to want to have oh, you yeah, on this yeah. show. I'm going to want to have you on the show that was going to be our premiere show. But it's this sort of concept that I have, which is my top 10 list. In other words, where do I want to put my money? And my number one thing is a sound man, because we often say that, uh, and look, we, we sell video stuff, and I, I tell people, you, your number one thing needs to be sound. Bad sound is intolerable, you have to leave. Bad picture could be an aesthetic choice. Mm -hmm. So you are so right in that, in that, and the number one thing when I watch a little indie project and I hear echoey sound, I'm like, and indie film. I know straight away that, that that all the emphasis nowadays seems to be put on picture and not on sound. God, I hope our sound is good. Right well, what now. is the number one thing? <laughs> I interrupted this show to tell him to turn that yes, air no, conditioning I know. off. I know. Right, right. And the reason I did that is because I did not want to hear that hiss on uh, on yeah. this show. Mm -hmm. So another thing, yeah. another thing I might impart to people is that. I, I've been a musician, and I've recorded sound my whole life, and I do record sound. I, all of us are using the cameras now, digital video cameras that also record sound, and they record it pretty well if you know what you're doing. But here's where people get tripped up, because it's so easy to record sound, and maybe your microphone, uh, let's say you put a lavalier on someone, maybe it sounds okay, and then the person that you have that mic on moves and there's rustle well a professional practiced sound person would know what to do about that or how to prevent that you might not so most of the time you're right it's simple to record sound and you can do it but if you it, as steve just said if you can afford a professional sound person they are going to send they're going to save you endless headaches endless headaches mm -hmm. absolutely they're worth their weight gold well, and that's what I tell people, you know, <clears throat> young people will often say, I can't afford this. But the, well, actually, my number one thing was food. Mm -hmm. You you have God, to have God, we food. think alike. We totally <laughs> think alike. So I mean, your, your I mean, budget has to go food, sound, and everything. And, and actually, camera for me was like number 10 mm -hmm. because there was script. Then there was a script doctor. People do not You're like right. when I say that because mm -hmm. they're like, why would I need a script doctor? I wrote this. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why you need it because you wrote it. Exactly. You need other opinions and feedback. exactly, you know, and the old system was the other issue is an editor. It's like when you can't be the best at everything. So like when we used to do a production, we had at the smallest production we had, we had 13 people involved mm -hmm. because we would have a DP. We might have a Usually that was our operator nine times out of ten and that was fine but you have to have somebody pulling focus uh you have to have grips we had to have an electrician to do tie-in uh, now you need a dit as opposed to an engineer but then when you get in a post we needed an editor so people nowadays are like oh shoot i'll edit my thing these are two totally different ideas man lucy who was our editor we used to just give her you know six hours of footage and she'd say come back in five weeks and we would come back and there would be tears in our eyes sometimes when we we were like wow we never envisioned that 
And this is the third thing I want people to take away from this show is that I hear people that say, if I don't do everything, it's not my film. Look, I'm a director. When I walk into a room and I say, like when we did Light and Shadow, that's my movie. And when you're the DP, you're going to say, that's my movie. The point is... It's a collaborative is, art. It's a collaborative art, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, when I gave that footage to Lucy, she gave me things that I never conceived of. Mm -hmm. I can always go in there and give her what we would call a line reading, which is, do this. And, but 95% of what she did was so amazing, and I never envisioned that. And I get that. That's, that's now my film. And I take credit for that. Yeah. It's but, important that people understand that to, to try to get what you can out of all of these other people mm -hmm. and then add afterwards. Like often when we go and we direct a scene, people say, you don't give me any input. I'm like, I don't give you any at all because I want to see what you bring to the game. I can always tell you what I want. Mm -hmm. you tweak it right. I mean, that's what I'm afraid is being lost now is that everybody's trying to be the one man band and you're not getting the benefit of all these other minds uh, and creative thoughts. You know what I mean? That, that you as a and director the joy will of working sculpt. together. David? Yeah, the joy of working together. Yeah. There's a real joy yeah. in working together. And, and to, to learn from other people, your own peers, it's a real joy. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. So we've got that. That's our third thing that we don't want people to lose today is the collaborative art. It is not a singular job, because if it is, think about it. All you're getting is the skills that you have. Mm -hmm. Well, not even just skills. It's thoughts. You know, it's other creative input that might not be there. It's try this. Try that. I never would have thought of that kind of thing. Exactly. And sometimes that comes from the, the you know, we, we, we sometimes have this issue where we don't want a grip talking to, well, we certainly don't want them talking to talent or going around the system but sometimes we're not really interested in what they have to say. And there's this concept that we think of things in a way that's a filmic way, okay? We would never think to do something in some weird way, but sometimes this person that's new to the game has this out of the box concept that would just be so out of our realm. And when we listen to that, which is sometimes is hard because you're, you're moving at a certain pace, they bring a perspective that we would never have thought of. David. Well, it's an art and it's a craft, and those are two different things, and it's a technology. Um, it's the perfect modern art form. It combines everything. I, I've always said that if uh, Richard Wagner, the 19th century composer, who, 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 you know, directed his own operas, wrote them, directed them, wrote the music, wrote the libretto. If he were alive today, he'd be a filmmaker. It's got everything going for it. You get to work with actors. You get to work with uh, scenic people and designers. It's amazing. But it's also a craft. And the reason I say that is because you, it's, it's valuable if you get to work with people. Uh, you, nobody emerges full-blown a great filmmaker. Everybody's made 10 bad films before they make their first good film that's important to know mm -hmm. that's really profound and it's like we we have this argument all the time <clears throat> me and Jens he calls himself a craftsman I try to call myself an artist so but I mean, how many years for 30 some odd years we've had this conversation yeah, it's kind of splitting hairs but I mean when I say craftsman like I went to, to a trade school essentially is what I think <laughs> you learn a craft all right and then you apply the art to it you know what I mean you got to still know how to use the lathe or whatever it is or you know what I'm saying? That's, well, so that's why I called myself a craftsman, you know, back But then. you use the tools. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I direct <laughs> the tools. Yeah, guess, uh, yeah. But the thing is, is that what people need to know is that way back when, these tools were so complicated. Like when you would go into a post room, yeah. there was a tape operator. That's just some guy in a room switching tapes. There was a Chiron operator who right. did your graphics. There was a, an editorial assistant. There was an editor. I mean, you know, uh, I'm going to use the word CMX, smile, he's going to smile, go back to David. Sure, CMX. Sure. Yeah, uh, CBS. ADO, you know, these are kinds sure. of things that... Automatic dialogue, yeah. you know, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> a, a, uh, how about that Ampex? Uh, no, that remember the Ampex thing, that digital uh, that allowed you to manipulate video? What was I thought that was called an ADO. Remember? You mean the Abacus? <laughs> 
I remember the abacus. There were yeah, anyway. There were all these yeah, we devices, but we couldn't <clears throat> operate them. CMX, CMX, you should explain, was a big editing system that was operated by buttons. Yeah. And the C, the uh, yeah. C was CBS, and I think the M, the MX was from Ampex, I think, oh if I remember God. right. Well, and, I mean, so there were all these devices, and this conversation really didn't kind of veered away from cameras, and I'm kind of okay with that. So I'm just going to catch people up. We went to the beta cam, and then we had high 8 mm -hmm. and then we had 8, and then we kind of got into that first DSLR. Who, who, intro who introduced 8 millimeter video? Do you remember? 8 hmm. millimeter. Oh, uh, yes. Um, hold on. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hitachi? Try Eastman Kodak. Oh yeah, that's right. That I know that now. I wow. remember. Yeah. yeah. So there was eight, then there was high eight, and then there was DV, and then there was DV cam, and you know, I guess it's really not that big of a deal. It's just like these tools changed. Yeah. Well, but I, if, we're, if we're sort of getting back to our topic, then what, where, where, in your opinion, David, is the turning point where we turned from having two camps, film and video, to where it's just a cinema tool now? That's a good question, and I would say the uh, advent of the digital age. Um, in my lifetime, I've gone from photochemical and mechanical, which is film, to analog video, which I had to master, to digital video, which is a completely different animal than analog video. Mm -hmm. So as the digital era uh, opened up on us, that changed everything. Yeah. So now when I, you asked, someone said earlier, what do we call the cameras now? I call them digital motion picture cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, on the low end, yeah, they're little camcorders. But on the high end, you know, like a Sony F65, that's a digital motion picture camera. Right. I think what but we kind of... Digital yeah. page, in, in back of me is DaVinci Resolve. And, uh, you know, which, which has Fairlight built into it now, which is, which is a full-blown audio mixing system. Hmm. I'm not pitching... Black magic right now. I'm just saying I'm stunned by what's in this. And someone said something a few moments ago about how it used to be quite complex. Like to be a CMX editor, you had to go through a training regimen. You had to be certified. And then you got paid a lot of money. And you got treated like a rock star if you were any good. I mean, it's kind of crazy the way, you know, anybody can operate Final Cut Pro now. Um, but this thing is extremely complicated. Uh, back in the film days, I would load film into a camera, and I'd take a light meter reading, and I'd press the button on the camera, and, and as Yen said, I would hear the whirring of the film, and I was good. I was good. Mm -hmm. Today, when I'm operating a camcorder, I'm doing handheld work. I'm like, an air, like, like a, a jet airplane pilot. I've got a 1,000 gauges in front of me, and I'm looking at everything because everything's constantly changing. And I'm having to, you know, do I have the right codec? Do I have the right aspect ratio or, or whatever? Do I have, you know, is it, is it HD? Is it 4K? What's the shutter speed? Um, Still need a am I recording or... raw? Is it MXF? Still I mean, it goes on and on. Assistant, so you don't have to think about that. You know what I mean? You know, when he said rock star, boy, that reminded me of something. Uh, the real rock stars were the color timers. Be oh yeah because i remember big uh, salaries big you just beat me to it man big salaries there was a mm -hmm. remember when i remember this kid uh joey scudero big cigar smoking yes situation we used to there. go to editel here in chicago and he was a young kid but boy he had an eye for color so it's like you didn't go, oh, I'm going to color time the thing myself like we did today. You went and you, they loaded your film up and, and you got Joey. And he was making, I remember somebody told me, 150000 a year mm. in 1987 doing color timing. And you were a rock star. You didn't go to a color timing place and say, okay, here, color time my film. You went to a color timing facility and said, I want Joey Scudero to color time my film. And these was, people were rock stars. Mm -hmm. Was he on a Da Vinci system? Uh, oh God, what was that? That that like in the eighties? Well, there, there's the Rank Centel. No, that was for the film that, transfer. That was a Telecine. Yeah, yeah, that was for the film transfer. What was like? Do you remember the rates? What were the hourly rates? Oh my Just God, a, a, a thousand an hour. Exactly, which you would pass on. 
client, of course. Right. I mean, yeah. people can't even envision this. But like when you would work in an online room, <clears throat> three fifty to depending on if you use digital, you know, if you use the titler, you paid more. If you use the digital manipulator, the I, the Ampex uh, uh, device, you paid more. But it, you were looking between 350 to 700 an hour for et, for online editing. Now we used to do a, what we would call an offline edit on three quarter inch, and then we would have like all of our numbers of this of what we wanted to do, and then we would go to the online room and we would pay that money. So the, the, these productions that we did in the 80s, you know, we had 50 to 150 thousand dollar budgets because there was a lot of these things you had costed. to have a budget mm -hmm. to make any money you had to have a budget yeah these high. things costed more you know i did a project one time and you might know about this on a thing called an e-film seat tap you, no i don't know what what is that that's where you actually edited on film and it took all the edge numbers and then they only transferred the exact scenes that you oh it's like a conforming like uh a, the exact uh, amount electronic of film. conforming kind of interesting and it got edited all at once but it turned out to be a disaster and they held my master hostage uh, have you ever had your master held hostage for money? Was that a Chica was that a Chicago thing? Okay, it was Allied Film and Video. Do you remember this company? Sure. They had they were in many locations. Uh, yeah, we we had a different system in New York. It used an optical printer, but it did the same thing. All right, the greatest innovation ever, the Mirage. Do you remember this Mirage? Oh, okay, so sure. I'm, I'm going to tell this quick story, and then we're going to go to Rachel and wrap up this video. Uh, what it was, I, and, and I, I saw this thing, and my wife was an online editor. She came from the old school, uh, offline, online, and then eventually when the Avid came out, she was an Avid editor. But I went to Editel, and I saw this thing where they had six, they, they would load all your footage on, in four-hour mode onto 16 beta max machines. And they had a device that would, so what it would do is it would queue up shot one on machine one, queue sure. up shot two on machine mm -hmm. two, queue sure. up, and you could literally, in a way, see your show in a nonlinear sure. yeah. fashion and make first changes. It was the first nonlinear editing kind I of. saw that to her and I said, Lucy, one day, you remember this because mm -hmm. I told the story a yeah. hundred times, sure. you're going to be able to put all of your video into some kind of a computer and we're going to be able to like see it at, you know, do a non-linear type of edit and see it. And a year later, I got a VHS tape in the mail. The only time anyone ever sent me a VHS tape in the mail. And it came from Avid. And I was like, there, that, that's the <laughs> thing I was talking about. And people don't realize that the problem was that when you used to edit uh, on tape, you could never reduce the length of your show because you were working from this point forward in what we called assembly editing. And, and David, you're gonna cut to the shot with David. I gotta see his face on this. Yeah, I, I know, <laughs> again. <laughs> and then you could do this thing called insert editing where you could put video on top of your show. But the one thing that we could never do unless we went down a generation, and people don't probably know what that is, which is where you took your master, you stuck it in your source machine, then you would record up to the point you wanted to reduce your show, take, and, and then, record the part you wanted out after him. Oh I got it so hard to explain. And by the time you got done doing your, what we would call an offline edit, you were like 14 generations old and you could barely read the time code anymore. Mm -hmm. But so this idea of nonlinear editing just changed our life in ways. To yeah, but that, that nonlinear system you're describing was using uh, what Betacam or Betamax cassettes. Yes. And remember that the cassettes had to pre-roll Mm -hmm. And before they switch, yes, of course. So there was a certain degree of frustration. If you remember the original Edit Droid, Edit Droid was uh, by, by Lucasfilm was a version of what you're describing, but it used uh, those laser discs, those analog laser discs, those right. big things that worked and made a lot of sound. Mm -hmm. um, this is all primordial ancient stuff we probably shouldn't be wasting time yeah, on it we're not gonna we're gonna go to rachel now and then we're gonna wrap this show up because i mean it's just the problem with this is that it, it is you can just go on and on and on and on about different stuff because it was fun and well, but the thing is is where we're at now 
is is the the this ease of production and speed and the ability to try things that we never had the ability to try before because there was a price on everything and you used to say to me that often that when when the money was a factor it forced us to be more creative Remember how we used yeah, to talk about that? Yeah, when you had limitations, that. you had to be more creative in some ways. So that's the danger now. If everything's too easy, I don't know, is the quality of uh, everything suffering or is it working the other way to where now your freedom is, or your, your creativity is freed because you don't have to worry about all the, all the, 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 the tech and, and things like it's that. It's an it, interesting question. It can, it can question. work both ways, I think. It's an interesting but question. There's, but there's also, there's also much more of it. Yeah. Because the, the, the barriers have fallen. Every film festival gets literally five to ten times as many submissions as they used to in the old days yeah and there's it's much hard to see everywhere it's, it, then it's almost hard to see but, the good through all the other masses of yeah junk so right. there's a constraint which is that you have to be that much better to rise to the top yeah well no, the cream will always rise to the top i don't but, buy that um it, it there was always a scenario where the, that's the problem in any creative art is that people don't want to realize Yes, this is available, and this is going to hurt people, what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> equipment is available, but the top of the crop is always going to be the 1% that really have the talent, the game, and the vision. There will be people that can make a living in this industry, and there always has been. But if you really want to be those Spielbergs, that is born in you. It isn't made in you. Mm -hmm. Rachel? Yeah. We do have one final question, which I think would be a good wrap up as long as everybody's just got one quick short answer, which is what is everybody's favorite camera they have ever worked with? That's from Victor, and I want to know as well. Oh, boy. That's uh, David, you start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've worked with more cameras than we have, probably. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm going to answer it in three parts. Uh, in the in the analog era, it was the one piece beta cam, any any number of them. They were great. In the uh, film era, it was the Aton in 16 millimeter. Um, in 35 millimeter, it's a toss up. I mean, an Ari or, or an Eclair, you know, um, in very noisy. In uh, digital, uh, the jury's out. I'm not sure yet. Mm. Wow, that is so tough. I mean, we. When the Hi8 format came out, we just thrived on that um, because it was fairly inexpensive. Uh, well, it was inexpensive, and it did give us the ability to really hone our craft and be able to see it on a monitor. In the film days, I got to go Airy SR2, mm -hmm. uh, not the SR1. Um, we also like the Airy S we use for doing silent work. Yeah. Um, we never had the luxury of being able to use a Panavision camera, which I would have, have been. Oh, you have. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have. Well, uh, and on. today, <laughs> I don't know. I'm starting to swing back mirrorless. You know, I mean, we we were really excited to see, you know, when the F5s and, and they went to cameras that gave us two XLRs and all right. this kind of jazz. Well, but you, the these these mirrorless things look great. You, you guys didn't really answer the question with one camera, right? I'm going to have to say um, it was probably the Vericam for me uh, in 2001 because it sort of combined, I mean, it was, it was still a production camera. Um, it had that aesthetic of film, you know, that, or in the early digital days. Uh, even though it was 720, it had that look, that Panasonic really captured that look in those days. So to me, that was one of the most liberating cameras because before that, all of our greatest work was shot on SD, and it kills me today yeah. because I, I know how good it looked live at the time, but the fact that it's captured on SD, a lot of that stuff, hurts me. But starting with the Vericam on, um, I think that was the camera that I enjoyed the most for a while there because that's when we were in the height of our production days too. You know yeah, I mean? it is painful that probably six or seven hundred of our videos are square in standard depth yeah. because that's what we had to do but uh david it it was uh, of of every guest we've ever had this is the greatest pleasure to be able to talk to somebody like you who has been through this industry in every single form or fashion so thank you so much for being on our show let's do it again my pleasure 
absolutely. <laughs> Rachel? And, and I agree with you, yeah. Jens. The Veracam was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rachel? That's a good answer. Yes, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you to ICANN who provide all of the lighting from our show. I learned a ton today. I hope everybody enjoyed watching. Next week we will be talking about the science of storytelling with Patrick Moreau from Muse Storytelling and Professor Anne Hamby who studies uh, storytelling and narrative at Hofstra University. So it should be a pretty new, interesting conversation. We hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye-bye.